three students. One conversation where film theory collides with the reality of filmmaking. Life after film school. Today's guest, Elizabeth Allen, director of the 20th Century Fox release, Ramona and Beezus. Ramona! Ramona! Ramona? I hope you are enjoying third grade. I think you may be here a while. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, I'm glad to be here. We always start the show with the same question. Please finish the following sentence. The most important thing someone should know before graduating film school is... I think it's important to graduate film school not having the attitude, where's my cookie? You know, I, I feel like you have to be prepared to enter a whole new journey and that things aren't going to be handed to you right away and that it's all a process and it takes a long time. And some of my most talented peers at film school are just finally starting to get a foothold. You know, the people that had immense talent. And it's just, it really is a long journey and you have to be prepared for that. So you grew up the daughter of a physicist, and you also graduated from Cornell by Beta Kappa. Um, <laughs> some may say that's not necessarily the most typical path a filmmaker may take. Tell us how you first got interested in film production. Well, I actually I started in the theater when I was younger, and uh, I had m because my dad was a physicist, we had to travel around the world. So I was constantly moving to different countries and didn't always speak the language, and I was so shy that my mother um, was concerned for me because I wouldn't talk much in school. So she put me into a full immersion theater arts program and uh, definitely, you know, g got me like straight in there and I started having to like perform and, you know, do various different things for the theater and I was working like in equity theater and I really got the bug and though I, r I did not like performing that much, I just loved to watch the process every day and so I started directing theater and um, did a little bit in New York and then I realized that film was even more democratic because it's more affordable and it's wider reaching and I just loved all the technical aspects of film so I moved out to LA and you know started my journey of becoming a filmmaker which took many 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 years. You then went on to school at USC and your short thesis film Eyeball Eddie premiered at Slamdance. As I'm getting ready to graduate something that I keep hearing from people is the most important thing to have coming out of film school is a short film that can act as your calling card. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think it was about Eyeball Eddie that made it so successful and stand out so much? You have to be prepared for what is going to get you hired in the future so I um, made sure that my film told a story that it that I cared deeply about that it had a hook because I didn't have a big marketing machine behind me so I had to have something that people would talk about you know and sort of spread the word and then I just didn't want anyone to tell me there was something I couldn't do so I put in their visual effects I put in you know stunts and you know huge fight scenes and crowd scenes and I had comedy and I had drama and I worked with kids and you know I was like I dare you to not hire me <laughs> because it was like you know there was a little bit of everything in it so. so in 2006 when you did get hired to direct Aquamarine that was your introduction to the studio system um, which there any directors first film in the studio system has got to be quite a learning process. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that was like? I already was starting to get a sense of, you know, how the studios were thinking and what they were looking for. And then when I got Aquamarine, um, they, I spent another year with them developing the script. So I was already really in the headspace of the company and I knew we were all like making the same movie, which I think is really important. You need that time to make sure that all the people involved are making the same movie. And um, then I was sent off to Australia for a year to go make it. <laughs> boy, oh boy, was that intense. Um, <laughs> again, it, because it was a teen film, but, you know, so everyone thinks, oh, it's a cute little teen film. But it had a hundred visual effects, a huge finale that ends in like a raging ocean storm with kids who couldn't swim. Um, you know, I had puppetry because of the tail. I had prosthetics that took hours to get in, you know, into. I had two leads that were 12 that could only work a few hours a day who had never, you know, headlined a movie before. And I'm by myself in Australia. So it was very, very intense. But fortunately, um, I was working with Fox 2000 
and uh, Elizabeth Gable, who was the president there, was such a champion because it was tough in the beginning. My God, I was not making my days, and you know, I was really under fire. But because she stuck with me and we worked together, I think we have an intense bond. And then she gave me Ramona and Beezus to direct as well. What do you mean by making your days? Uh, well, making your days is sort of just a slang expression for whether or not you'll get hired again by the studios. <laughs> <laughs> no, because um, basically you have um, a, a very intense schedule. It's always rigorous. You're always trying to do more than you can in any given day on a, on a film. And you break it down and you, you know, do a certain amount of scenes per day and it's all scheduled. And if you can't make it by the time, you know, the kids turn into a pumpkin or whatever, then you haven't made your day. <laughs> you also directed an episode of Gossip Girl. Mm -hmm. We've had showrunners come in and tell us before that coming in on an established show is a very difficult thing to do. How was that experience for you? I had to go through probably like 20 interviews just to get the job on Gossip Girl. And I was like, what is going on? I have to give up my firstborn child to get a job <laughs> on television. But um, I understand why now, because it's it really is such a different skill. Because a lot of what you're doing is you're meeting with the showrunner who's developed the show. I mean, it's really their baby. It's not yours. And you're just lucky enough to be there helping them facilitate it. And so a lot of what you're doing, you're adding your own ideas, but you're really like kind of there just to help them, you know, show, put their voice on screen. And you also are working like a madman because you're trying to do like 50 some odd pages in like seven to eight days. And you know, that's, that's tough. That's a tough shoot in features that would never be that intense. So, um, you know, it's just, it's a different skill. Hey. Hold still, I'm almost done. It's picture perfect, right? Let's be realistic, Ramona. This is a curling iron, not a magic wand. But all things considered, I'd say you've never looked better. I love it. Thanks, Beezus. So your new film, Ramona and Beezus, is based on the very popular children book series by Beverly Cleary. So did you read the books growing up, and how did you first get involved in the project? When I was five years old, I got the chicken pox, and um, so I was out of school for like two weeks and miserable. And I um, was just starting to be able to read on my own, and my mother got me the Ramona series, and I read them with her, and they were so seminal for me because it was the first time where I completely related to a young girl in a book because it really just gets into her head. And then I got a call from Fox a few years after I'd finished Aquamarine and they offered me the movie on the phone. I'll never forget that day because you have to just pinch yourself on it. It's something that you've grown up on that's made such an impact on you that it's kind of part of your life. Like sometimes I would blend my own memories with Ramona's, you know, like, oh wait, was that me or did I read that in Ramona? <laughs> but, um, and so the, to be offered that, and they had no idea that it had been such an important book to me. So it was something where I called my mother and she just cried like tears of joy. It was amazing. Beverly Cleary wrote the Ramona books about 50 years ago, but was never willing to release the movie rights until now. Why do you think it took so long, and what was the process of acquiring the rights like? Well, Beverly was always concerned about releasing the movie rights to the book because she just wanted to make sure that, you know, it was done properly if it was ever made. And she's in her 90s now. She just turned 95 last week. And she just decided, you know, it's time. I want to be part of it, and it's time to ha let it happen. But um, it took, there were a couple of different companies competing to get the rights. And so it took my producers, who had a lot of passion and conviction about making the movie, it took their passion to get it, you know, to get her convinced. Alison Greenspan, who's one of the two producers, it's her first actual full on producer credit that she's getting on this movie because it was really her drive that got the rights. And she flew up there with her second grade book report. <laughs> on construction paper and she's like she put it in front of Beverly she's like please let me be you know your producer and they had also done Little Women which was a beautiful book adaptation that was you know nominated for many Academy Awards and they had done uh, James and the Giant Peach and a lot of different movies Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants where she felt like she was gonna be in good hands with these producers so she said yes <laughs> did you ever get to meet with Beverly yeah I met Beverly Cleary um, as soon as they brought me onto the project uh, Allison and Denise, the producers, and the executives at Fox, we all got on a plane and we flew up there and we met her. It was very, you know, sort of formal and I was nervous as can be, even though I already had the job, you know, but, um, 
and uh, you know, it was just one of those days I'll never forget in your life. How did that impact the way you looked at directing the film? Well, Beverly was involved in the project from the beginning with me, and she would read the script and you know give me notes. So there was always a connection throughout the whole process, and we checked in with her a lot over the course of the movie. And her son was on the set, and I put him in a couple of scenes and stuff. So I was always making sure that we were in touch and that we were representing exactly what she wanted on the screen. Pieces, pieces, I won't take. Oh. Ramona is such a beloved character, and I'm sure you wanted to stick closely to Beverly Cleary's creation. But books are very different than film. What aspects of the character did you have to keep, and what did you want to change? Beverly's books are particularly difficult to adapt because so much of the prose is about getting inside of a little girl's head. So unless we're going to do voiceover, it's very, very difficult to exteriorize every moment of what she's thinking. Because there could be chapters about Ramona stressing about getting a bad school picture, but to depict that on the screen isn't all that cinematic because it doesn't feel like the stakes are that high, you know? So a lot of what we had to do when adapting it for the, for the screen was to create bigger stakes. And we also did, we exteriorized her imagination with dream sequences. Um, there are these imagination sequences throughout the movie that help to kind of show what's going on in her mind. And uh, that Beverly was on board with that. She was really excited about that because she had such a vivid, kind of out of control imagination that would always get her in trouble. It's like, if you're doing it on the big screen, you might as well see it in Technicolor. 